Hi everyone, this is Grace, and today I'll be walking you through how I made this Shamrocks set. So let's go. Now this is my beginner Shamrocks online class. Go check out the link in the description if you are curious. It is nine different designs. I'm having <laughs> a momentary brain fart. I believe it's nine. Um, all Shamrocks for, you guessed it, St. Patrick's Day. And it is a beginner class. So that means that we are rocking one consistency, as always, my thick flood. And there are no extra sprinkles, doodads, all that kind of stuff with this set, which I love for my beginner classes, especially extra stuff just means more money spent on supplies. Am I right? So <laughs> this one, I was really tempted to do uh, clovers, which is the four leaf, in addition to or instead of the shamrock because the clover, it just has more surface area to do fun, different things with. And if you've watched my YouTube video, you've probably seen the clover shape series set. Um, but St. Patrick's Day is all about the Holy Trinity, right? And so that's what the clover represents. This here... I had this in my brain as just doing a really simple wet on wet clover in a clover. And so it's really simple. <laughs> and we just flood the base and then do three big dots. The key here is to get them really close but not touching. And then you can see here, I'm just fixing the little edge. You want to pull from the outside of the clover or the dot. Um, the only one that you want to pull all the way through is that top one. I tried doing a shamrock, so four leaves with that little wet on wet design, and it just, it looked too crowded. It just didn't look as good, which is fine because, like I said, this is all about the shamrocks, the three leaves. So this next one might not be everyone's favorite, but <laughs> that's okay. A lot of St. Patrick's Day celebrations involve this particular beverage. <laughs> and I did not come up with putting beer on a shamrock. Believe me, <laughs> it's been done many times before. But it is a really fun technique to learn how to do the bubbles because you can apply that for champagne. You can apply that if you're doing like a root beer float cookie or something like that. This bubble technique is something that is just a good thing to know in my not so humble opinion. <laughs> so we're working pretty fast here because we've got one consistency. And we're doing wet on wet. So in a moment, okay, what I'm doing here is I'm piping the dots on top in a circle. You see how I'm kind of like outlining and then filling in as opposed to injecting the circle like I did with um, the first wet on wet design. Because when you inject like you keep squeezing until your dot gets big enough, you're adding a lot more icing than the technique I'm doing here. And this kind of thing is very likely to over flood, especially since you're doing one consistency outline and flood. And if you're doing two consistency, then you would have a dry outline that would help the icing stay in, but obviously you don't here. So then the next thing to do is to immediately pipe another circle on top, but offset. So all you're left with is the little bubble situation on the bottom. I think this looks so cool. <laughs> Obviously the second dot is um, the same color as the flood. Obviously also my circles are not all that perfect, but they are good enough. <laughs> so we're going to let that crust over before going to the foam part. And y'all know how much I love me some crackle. Thank you. Losing my brain. Love me some crackle. And that is what we're going to rock here. Sorry, I was just so mesmerized by myself piping. <laughs> Um, the important thing here is you, you want to give like a millimeter or two on the very edge. You can see I'm not, I'm, I'm playing with fire here with how close I am to the edge, because this is very likely to 
fall over or spill over. You can see on the left there that it, it was totally over flooding, but that's a very easy fix while the icing is still wet. And you know what? It's supposed to be over flooding beer foam anyway. So if your fear, fear, if your foam over floods, it's all good. And then add a couple of dots at your discretion, just for funsies. Let that crust for about 10 to 20 minutes. How long you need before the crackle just depends on how thick the icing is, the environment you're in. If your icing is thinner, it's going to take longer. If it's hot and humid, it's going to take longer. So just keep that in mind. If it's more like an indent, that just means that the icing hasn't dried enough. And you truly want to crack the surface, not puncture it. So next up, I think, yeah, this is what I'm calling the realistic one. Um, <laughs> something that's kind of funny about this cookie cutter is I find the center of the leaves an oddly hard place to eyeball, which is why I use the scribe there just to poke the center. And even then, I feel like it could have gone probably a little farther up. Oh, well. You can also see here that I'm not flooding all the way to the edge. Um, for this design, we're doing all the leaves separately. And this here is just meant to look messy. So I did the double line because I wanted the white to be a little more prominent. If I, if I had done just one line, um, the white part wouldn't have been as prominent. So let that crust over. You just need like 10 to 15 minutes just until it dries enough so that when you pipe the section next to it and it, uh, next to it, it doesn't flood into the, to the previous one. Um, because of the design of this set or like the situation of the clovers, you really have to do them individually, which is kind of annoying because it just takes more time, but it's not the end of the world. <laughs> And you can see here, I'm just going back and forth. Obviously, I'm not cleaning off my scribe. Working quickly is the name of the game here. Just going back and forth. The However far you pull the scribe is how far the color is going to go. So just keep that in mind. And as you can see here, the white lines that I'm piping, they do not need to be done perfectly because you're just going to mess with them anyway. And then finish it off with just a simple little stem and she done. That's what I call the realistic one. I don't, I, I always make a point with these single shape sets to make sure that I'm doing about half that look realistic and about half that are just for funsies. Um, this one here would be a for funsies moment for sure. <laughs> um, I call this one the jumper, which you're going to see imminently why. Well, why I call the jumper. So it reminds me of a ski sweater, like skiing on the slopes, French Alps or something like that. And so we're like in Europe skiing is what I'm imagining with this sweater. And the Brits call sweaters jumpers. So I'm saying in my head like jumper, although I'm sorry for butchering <laughs> the British accent. So this is just another application of some fun wet on wet. We do a different use of the scribe later on in this set. So here we're pulling and we're cleaning off the scribe after every pull. That's one technique with lines and a scribe pull. 
Another technique is to um, do a continuous pull on the scribe. So as you can see, I let that first one crust over because again, we're doing the, the flooding in sections here. We're doing one at a time, letting it crust, doing the next one. So with a one consistency like this, where that the flood is going to be thicker because it has to be thicker, you're going to have less time to work with it for wet on wet. So this technique where you're cleaning your scribe off after every pull, it takes longer because you have to clean your scribe off. So that's why I decided to do this technique on a smaller surface, just doing one leaf at a time. But you'll see later that the, the continuous scribe pull um, is done on a larger cookie surface. And that's because when you can just pull through and not have to clean off every time, it just is a lot faster. And I'm being very mindful again of how far I'm pulling that scribe out because if done correctly, that's how far the color is going to pull. And something to keep in mind is the thicker your scribe, the more color it's going to pull with it. The thinner your scribe, the less it's going to pull. So I would say the scribe I'm using here is kind of like a medium size. And for this technique, you do want to be relatively clean about where and how you're placing those lines. I do think a part of the success of this design is having the lines relatively close, but keep in mind that since you're adding a flood line, like it's a line of flood consistency, it is going to spread out a bit. So that definitely takes some getting used to. And then for this one to finish it off, that last one has crusted and uh, I decided to flood in the entire stem with this one and not just do like the more realistic skinny stem. Moving on, I think this might be the, <laughs> the other one that I was talking about. So let me talk about the colors for a second while I figure out which one this is. Um, this is, I love this set, three colors, green, orange, and white. Now the, the orange is very on the yellow side. I made it by using orange straight out of the bottle and adding extra yellow to it. Um, it's a bit more reminiscent of the Irish flag that way. This was not meant to like super color match the Irish flag, but it's supposed to be reminiscent of it. So that's why I rocked those colors. The green is a leaf green with a tiny bit of yellow added to it because I find leaf green to be more on the blue side of a green. Um, and I don't know, whenever I'm doing like things that are supposed to be real foliage greenery, like I tend to make them more of a yellow green. I don't know. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is the other wet on wet design. My in initial inspiration for this one was kind of like a rainbow. You know, lots of rainbows are in St. Patrick's Day imagery, but I had to do my own little spin on it. Of course, you could leave this as is. I mean, that doesn't look terrible, but we're going to take our scribe <laughs> and this is the continuous pull. Now the key here is to have nice, tops and bottoms, nice top and bottom curves. Et voila. Now, next up, what is this one? Ooh, this is the crackle. So <laughs> I did make a wee bit mistake on this one as I was filming it, which I'll show you in a second. This is total inspiration from one of my favorite cookies from my Clover Shape series set. Um, I also did a beer one. Um, this was my mistake. So I should have crackled 
the top portion first and then flooded this bottom, but my brain was elsewhere when I filmed this. And I filmed the last cookie that I decorate of each um, of each design. So this was the only opportunity. Now, as like an expert cookier, I can work fast enough that this is totally fine. And the window that you have to crackle is like 10 to 15 minutes, I'd say, solidly after it's like ready to crackle. So not a big deal. Um, but when I'm teaching beginner classes, I like to make sure that I'm doing everything um, as, what's the word? Um, as correctly as possible. Now for this one, since I did that big fat stem on the bottom second, um, that obviously creates a divide now so I can do the left and the right at the same time instead of doing them separately. Rocking the crackle again. All you need for the crackle technique is just some sort of tool with a rounded end to it. Um, in this case, this is just a simple scribe from Amazon. You can use a pen top, whatever. Just make sure it's clean, obviously. <laughs> um, and that's that. What is this one? Ooh, is this, I bet this is the leopard. So, okay, <laughs> leopard, I love leopard. I use this in quite a few of my beginner sets and quite a few of my shape series sets generally, just because it's so versatile, you can do so much with it. Um, and it's a lot easier than polka dots. <laughs> I know that seems surprising, but I swear it is. So what I love about leopard in particular um, is that it's just meant to be blobs, right? So these are all inconsistent blogs, like blogs, blobs. The more inconsistent they are, the better in my opinion. Um, and then you come in with an outline. Sometimes I do two around the little blobs. Sometimes I do one. I fill in the spaces with kind of a little short line. It's not really supposed to be a polka dot. It's just supposed to be like a little jagged line. Um, typically I'll do this col color, like a color scheme. If I'm doing a gradation from like the lightest, lightest color is flooded. The blobs are the medium color and then the darkest color is the top color. But this is obviously not like, like a gradation of colors. Um, I could have done this with a white base. I mean, I actually could have done this with any combination. Just the point is you want to have as much contrast as possible, I think, with doing leopard. Now for this one, ooh, this is the plaid. Okay, so I'm also a little obsessed with doing plaid and as of late, I love doing a two layer plaid. I find that particularly helpful, easier when doing one consistency outline in flood because um, you have to work pretty quickly with plaid in order to lay all the lines without them sticking up.
So I'm doing the first layer of plaid wet on wet. I find the key with a successful plaid is making sure that there's plenty of, is it negative space? Is that what the word is? Like you want enough space in between the plaid sections for real definition. If they're too close together, it looks too cluttered. So this one we're gonna flood. And you can see here, I even had to use my scribe to settle the last couple lines because that flood had already started to crust a bit on those edges. That crusted over, you know, just 10, 15 minutes. Don't need a lot of time. Um, and then and then we can pipe the second set of lines. You can see that I'm keeping them pretty tight next to the orange ones to keep that definition. And there we go, that is the plaid. Last but certainly not least is what I'm lovingly calling <laughs> the marbled one. This was a little more out there. Um, I wanted to do kind of a twist on polka dots. So you're gonna see here that this actually starts as polka dots and you could definitely leave it as polka dots if that's what you prefer. Um, but you're gonna see in a second what we do to those polka dots. So pipe in the polka dots. Now this is cute on its own, right? Doing a fair number of polka diddles. And then here I am aiming to pull through the center of each dot, trying not to go the same way each time. And you're gonna see here I do a first pass And then I go in for a second pass to kind of go like perpendicular through the dots just to have even more marbled goodness. So that is it, my friends. That is the beginner Shamrocks online class. As always, I hope you learned a thing or two. I hope you enjoyed this video. And maybe you will even make these cookies yourself. Go check out the class if you are curious or go make them totally on your own. Um, check out my blog as well. I've got lots of great resources in all of those places. I love y'all and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day.